1990. Okay. So 1990. So I've been at the city from 1981 to 1990. I've been there nine years. Okay. Got my master's in 87. There's an assistant planner, two senior planners, and then me. And they told Don, you're going to retire. Everybody freaks out, right? So the assistant guy's like, oh, I don't want that job because it's insane. It's a political appointment by the mayor and city council. And they so they let Don go. And I said, what's the plan? They go, we're going to hire a world-class planner. So they hired, I'm not even going to say his name, but they hired this guy, comes in, big reputation, comes in and he drank a lot. And Mayor Fricassi was the mayor back then. And Mayor Fricassi was tough, Irish, um, Italian. And he ran, he was just the mayor, but he appointed the city planner. Took great pride in that. Him and Don, it was like Don's dad, kind of. So he, I remember coming to me, said, I hired this guy. I want you to learn from him. He said, you're not ready. I said, say I'm ready. I got three people ahead of me in this organization. I'm not asking to be ready. I'll just keep working. Don't worry about it. So I'm still teaching tennis, doing all this other stuff. I'm, I worked at from mid. I would run six miles every night from midnight to one thirty. Go work at a uh, office building, cleaning offices, because I would get away from my practice wife as much as I could, with respect. So I just kept working, make a little bit more money. So um, and they knew I was working so many hours. So I'd come in. I'd slept like two hours a night. Would just keep working. So this guy comes in. I remember the second week he's there. He's like, "Hey, what should we put on this building on eight mile?" Me being a smart butt, I said, a strip club. In Detroit, all the strip clubs are on the south side of 8 Mile. And he said, oh, good. Can you get find one? And I'm like, dude, you dude, dude, you can't have strip clubs in the south. That's why they're in Wayne County. We're in Oakland County. And I knew right then this guy was a phony. He wasn't what he was meant mm. to be. Went to the mayor and go, you hired that guy. You better watch him. He's going to get us in trouble. Because he was willing to do anything, Didn't whether matter. it was legal, not legal, Didn't the matter. right thing to do, yeah. right? Yeah. And I said, if he's asking me, we got a problem. So they, that guy maybe made it eight, nine months, and then they let him go. And I remember, now what are you going to do? And it's like, uh, everybody wanted to be the city planner in Southfield, but now here's the highest ranking guy failed. So for Ka- Don for Cassie, Mayor for Cassie brought me in, and he goes, listen, he goes, Nick, you're freaking bull in a china shop. I can't give you this job. I'm like, I'm not asking for the job. I just want to respect somebody that I can learn from. So just don't make another mistake. He said, well, I'm in no hurry. So you and God bless, rest her soul, Carol Steiniger, you two figure it out. That job paid $70,000 more than I was making. And Carol probably made $30,000 more. I mean, I, I didn't have any money. I wasn't used to having money. I didn't care. So um, I lived pretty simple. Karen did okay for us. So I... Through all of this, I decided, Karen and I decided, we're going to be the first ones in my family to ever get divorced. We get divorced amicably. Everything worked out fine. And I, so I just worked, 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 worked. So um, I remember the first meeting I went to, it was Target. So somebody had just got shot on 8 Mile in Southfield. Didn't happen very often. Target came in, the first Target, and they wanted to put Target at Northland. Northland was booming back then. And their symbol was a giant Target. So the mayor looks at me and he goes, so he said, so you have to go in front of the public and this company named Target from Minneapolis wants to put a store there and you have to explain them. They can't put a bullseye on Northland. And I'm like, I, who am I to tell them that? Somebody's got to tell me, well, I'm, we don't have a city planner. You can't, you, I can't do that. And they, he's like, well, then Carol, you do. So we went to the public hearing. We're there and the, all the brasses from Minneapolis were sitting there. And I pull up the site plan. Back then, I literally drew the maps, did these little slides, went in the dark room, developed slides, made a presentation, and I did all that for Carol. She sits up there, and it lasted three minutes. I'm not exaggerating this. She, we always told the story. The first council person said, "Miss Steiniger, you are bringing this thing with a bullseye to Northland? What are you, nuts? And she started crying. She turned around. I was sitting behind her to run the slideshow. She goes, I can't do this. It flips me the script, and I'm like, and the mayor looks at him. This is Southfield on TV. And he goes, Oh my. Sit goodness. in the seat, Nick. And I'm like, I still gives me chills. I'm like, Oh crap. I almost wet myself. So I sat in there. And I said, Let me explain this to you. This is a mess. And I went through it. We ended up approving that. Two weeks later was the first Home Depot in, in Michigan. And they wanted to go on a landfill in Southfield. And they wanted that bright orange Home Depot. And Mayor Fricassi had a huge ego. He's like, Mm-mm. Tell him it's got to be burnt orange. So I had to sit in front of all these people and tell the owner of Home Depot, you can't have the orange you want. I had to tell Red Roof Inn, you had to have a brown roof in Southfield. So I did that for four months. Every meeting was like these nasty decision things, and I'm getting stuck with them. 
I'm figuring so you're pretty much me. being put in the situation of, 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 the, of the yeah of that role. So they're without like, being actually in that position or being paid for it. Not for that at matter. all. And I thought, <laughs> what am I doing? And my dad's like, you're gonna they're gonna run you out of town. You're fighting all these big corporations. And then so fast forward, fast forward. It's a Monday night holiday. I'm working. Mayor for Cassie calls me. Come in and see me at the party store. He ran a party store. He goes, what are you doing tomorrow? I go, I'm going to council meeting. It's Tuesday because we're on a holiday. He said, um, uh, it's, I'm working. He's like, okay, well, ask your mom and dad what they're doing. I go, my dad's working. My mom's, I don't, what? He goes, I need them to come to the council meeting. He said, I'm going to appoint you city planner tomorrow night. And I'm like, me? And this is one, it was one year from zero money to this is exactly a year. He said, it's been a year I've been watching you. You're still a bull in a china shop, but I think we're going to have a good run here, Nick. Okay. So that's Monday night. Call my dad. He's like ecstatic. I'm like, oh, this is insane. I'm going to be the city plan. The third one in the history of the whole city. And I came in in the morning. at like six, I'm not a morning person now. I was then. Six in the morning, I come in up City Hall by myself, had my little bag lunch. I'll go into my office and I smell smoke. I'm like, oh, crap, the building's on fire. So I came up the stairs. Don't forget this. Now, Don Gross, the legendary guys, when they fired the other guy, we locked that door. It was a beautiful, giant office. No one's getting that office until the city planner sat in there. So I saw smoke coming from under the door. I'm like, oh, my God, the freaking building's on fire. So I go to open the door and it opens. And I look and there's Don Gross who had been in the basement for three years sitting there. This is back to me. Smoking a pipe, and in those three years, no smoking in public buildings. You couldn't do that. So he's sitting there, and and he's like, "Sit down." I'm like, "Don, it's six in the morning. Are you what's wrong? You having a nervous breakdown?" He's like, "No." He spun around, put his feet up on the desk, and he goes, "Sit down." He goes, "So uh, what are you doing tonight?" I'm like, "I'm working." He said, "No, no. What's going to happen tonight?" I didn't know anybody knew. And he goes, "I talked to the mayor." He goes, "So you're getting appointed city planner tonight." And gives me chills. Yes, sir. He said, so, does this feel familiar to you at all? And I looked at him. I said, again, creeps. I'm like, yes, sir. And he goes, three, nine years and 355 days ago, I asked you one question. What was I said, you asked me, what are you going to be doing in 10 years? I go, what would you answer? I go, I'll be sitting in your seat. He got up. He goes, sit down. By one day under 10 years, and I got that job. And I kept that job from 1991 so I left there in 2010, and that's my story to people. Like I, oh my, God. I, I can't even. My, I know it's so cool. <laughs> that is and, the and crazy. That they believed thing. in me. So you ask me what I saw myself. I don't know. I, I'm not that deep a thinker. They saw something in me that they knew I was honest, hardworking, and I love that. Self became Well, I think my that's. I, I guess just, that matters. I mean, so. I think that's so crazy. I, I it proves the the secret to what you you believe works for you and that's you just do the work and the results come as a result of that right so I, that i just can't even wrap my head around the fact that you weren't necessarily you said that right in that statement and i don't know why i said it right you said it off the cuff and i mean do you have to imagine there was something subliminal where you were just naturally working towards it right so even I, if you weren't yep intentionally so, doing so yep so i'm gonna tell you that Again, no smoke, no drink, no nothing. I was a wild man in other ways. And um, God's got to have a plan for me. I look every day. I'm thankful. I've been married to Kim for my wife now for 38 years, I think. We're 30 some years, 86 to now. Yeah, 38 years. And it's like, I, I don't know what the plan is. I look up every day going, geez, thanks, but I probably don't deserve this. But I'm trying to do the right thing. I'm not a religious man, but I'm a, I'm a faithful man. I, I believe that. I've had many moments in the woods, cross country skiing, going, looking around, going, "Wow, this is there's something different here." So, I don't know what my mission in life is: is to share with other people experience, suck in their ex life experiences, yeah. and then expound the good ones to try to keep. And that's what you've path. done your whole career is kind of learn from other people and, mm -hmm. and use what you thought was valuable, right? And so, um, I just think that's so special, and I think it's so important for people that are watching to understand that. You don't have to have the perfect plan. You don't have to have it all figured out. Mm -mm. And a lot of times when you just do the right things, you take the right actions, meaning you do things in good faith, you work hard, simple stuff, nothing out of the ordinary. You weren't any smarter than anybody else. You didn't do anything extraordinary. Mm -hmm. You ultimately worked hard. 
you never, most importantly, I think this is huge is that you never asked for anything that you didn't earn tenfold first. Right. And so I think that's super valuable, especially kind of what we were talking about from my generation comparatively to yours is people do one thing and they just, they, they need to have some type of return or an immediate yeah, that's pat the on the back or whatever you, you it is. You guys think more immediate. And I thought it is a mar- I used to run a lot and it was always a marathon, not a sprint. I, I couldn't, I couldn't run a marathon at back then. I would run 10 Ks and then I get so mad when I couldn't beat my own self at what I said. My girlfriend, yeah. can, can I tell you this right? So yeah. it doesn't end though. And I want people to understand this. So here I'm, I get a, sto- I'll call it a story. I've been told it's a story career and stuff. I get to build that town through all the towns that are all these different things. Like it's the greatest time to ever be a city planner was in that city in edge city of Detroit. And I never, I was the head of the American planning association, but not because I wanted to, they asked me to be it. And I would be like the, it's almost like I'm self deprecating. I know what I'm doing. I, I know to make, I make fun of myself all the time because it makes other people feel less, I'm not intimidating. My, my credentials no, I hear, say I I'm hear, intimidating. Well, that was the point of that's the point of these interviews and how I intrude, tr- introduce you from the beginning is there. You look at that title and it seems so unattainable, so uh, strategic, planned, exactly what, like what we talked about. Exactly. That you it wasn't at all. You you did your best and you worked really hard. You never asked for something that you didn't earn. And 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 I can tell when the day came. So in 2009, city of South was starting to change a lot and. I was starting to get a little frustrated that I didn't necessarily love the dimension where we were going. And we lost the city manager. And then they're like, you're going to be a city manager. I'm like, nope, I'm the deal maker. I'm the city planner slash economic development director. We could talk about a whole different thing. There was no thing called economic development. Don Gross said, I want you to make up a title. I want you to become, we need to fight for all the people in Suffolk. They want to go to Troy, Livonia, Novi. We need that. It's economic development. I'm like, what are you talking about? Make it up. Just, we're going to, you're going to go hire somebody that's going to help you understand how to read bottom line financial sheets so that we can talk business talk to businesses. So now I'm a planner and economic development director. That eventually spins off to hire a real economic development person. I just keep doing the planning stuff. At 2009, I remember saying, I'm starting to burn out a little bit, thinking, oh, I, I don't know what's next. But And I thought I'd, I'd stay there until I was 80 years old working. And they all did too. They, I, they invested in me and I was part of them. Mayor Cassie left. Mayor Lawrence came on. Brenda Lawrence is now a congressman, famous. And her and I were a great team. But again, my dad just passed away. And on his deathbed, he said, your journey's not over yet. Mm-hmm. Okay, what does that mean, Dad? He's, I'm just telling you, Nick. Literally, he asked to take, he had COPD. He asked to be taken off of morphine for 13 minutes so he could talk to me and my mom. And oh, he just goodness. said that. And I'm like, oh, what does that mean? So three months later, this, the city engineer, a guy named Gary Tressel, city engineer of Southfield, calls and he said, can I talk to you a little bit? And I, he kind of worked for me. Like I would have the engineering guys work for me. So he said, so you seem like you're getting a little burned out here. You want to keep going? I'm like, what are you talking about, Gary? He's like, city of Rochester is going to start this thing for economic development. They want a deputy city manager slash Community Development Director, Economic Development Director. Longest title of all time. Right? I was I had yeah, a really you, tough time reading yeah, it. It's it's horrible. So I said, <laughs> what are you talking about? He goes, you don't know this about me, Nick, but he was a workaholic. I am the city engineer in Rochester, Michigan. Where is that at? I didn't have a clue. He was like, I know. That's Northern Oakland County. You don't know. But he said, so I said, why would you even do this? I thought you loved me here. And he's like, I do, but I know you're a good family guy. I'm here. I'm skipping a whole part of my life. I'm coaching my son and all these people. And I just, I don't have any idea how my family survived me working, how many hours I did. Yet I got to be part of their lives too. He's like, wouldn't it be nice to slow down a little bit? And I, something bad happened in Southfield that got my wife to the point where she's like, we're moving away from here. Mm. So we bought 10 acres in Lake Orion. And I said, I'll quit my job, you guys, if you won't let me leave. Because you had a, they could make you live in the city you lived in. We lived right Mm. in Southfield. And they said, they're changing the state law in three months. So you just be quiet, stay here three months. And we bought this house in Lake Orion, came a dragon. My kid, Steffi went to school there. Devin went to Notre Dame prep, blah, blah, blah. We're playing lacrosse and hockey and all this stuff. So I, I said to Gary, why would you recruit me for a place I never heard of? He's like, it's 10 minutes from Lake Orion. And you're driving back and forth, back and forth. Mm. Why don't you have, and then 
they will pay you. You can retire from Southfield and still make money in Rochester, and Kim can quit her job. My wife's this incredible woman that made a lot of money in her career. At the, she was the private executive secretary of the chairman of the board of a tier one automotive all of her life. Mm-hmm. And I thought, you know what? She, she wanted to open a cookie company, a little cookie store in Lake Orion. It's like, you could do it. You would make your salary and more. Somebody pissed me off during the day at Southfield, and Gary happened to call me. He said, I just want you to meet the mayor of Rochester in the city boundary. He's this young guy. They're both young, but James Vitrano is extremely young. They brought him in. At, James, I don't know if you knew this, but James was one. I went to Rochester University. Oh, yeah, he was you one told of my, me that. Yes. That, so James, so he just, James called me. He's like, come on. I go, you, you can't, aff- no disrespect, you can't afford me. Like, I know I can't, but your pension, I could pay you a third. You make your pension and you'll still be, never have to work again. Mm. How do you know how much money I make? He's like, it's public record, you idiot. And I'm like, okay. So Gary Tressel, God love him, comes in. He hands me a piece of paper. He said, open it up. That's what your pension is. Now, I won't, this doesn't matter, but I would have guessed half of the number he wrote on the paper. My dad had a pension. For, my dad worked 55 years for Dear One. His pension was $47,000. So I thought that's what mine would be. In my brain, they paid me a whole lot of money, but I earned it all, but I had no idea. What's a multiplier and all this stuff? So he hands me this paper. I'm like, what is that number? He goes, you can lay in bed and make that much money. <laughs> I said, you're full of crap. So I went to HR, walked in. They're like, what do you want? And I'm like, if I retired, well, I was 54. What would my pension be? And I remember Val Crump, the same lady that was there, looked at me. She goes, get out of my office. Why would you even ask me that? And I thought, I, I'm, I just want to know. She goes, Nick, seriously, you thinking of retiring? You, you can't. You're staying here for 30 more years. I'm like, just can you give me a number? Fine. She gave me the number. And then she said, I didn't know this, but she was about to leave. <laughs> she was about to retire. She goes, so remember when you hired here, you were in civil service? Yep. Remember you get, they take money out of your paycheck? Nope. Never had enough money. Don't know. I don't know anything. She goes, well, you did for 20 years. And then we met, blah, blah, blah. And then she signs me a piece of paper. She goes, that's your money. And if you put it in real estate or something, you can avoid taxes um, if you walk out the door. Because I didn't take vacation. I'm... 45 years in, never had a sick day ever. I In Rochester right now, I have 500 hours of vacation built up. I have 600 hours of sick time. I, I'm just lucky like that. So she said, you're going to get this check that you can do whatever you want with, and this is your pension. I'm like, oh, crap. So I didn't know what to do. Went home. Kim's like, yeah, bad day, yeah, bad day. And I said, here's want to see something funny. I slide the piece of paper to her, two of them. Oh, my goodness. She's like... Are you not, you are you are making less than zero dollars an hour? You're paying them to work there every day. I could quit my job. I could run the cookie store, and you you're going to retire. And that was right when my dad was just about to pass away. And I went into him and said, "Dad, I got to stay here until I die." Right? He's like, "You gave him everything you had, son, and your journey's not done yet." And he died 13 minutes later. So I went into Mayor Cassie. I said. Oh, I think I'm going to retire. And they just exploded. And, and he was a councilman then and Mayor Lawrence. So bad divorce, six months. They made me wait six months to go to Rochester. Met Jeff Cuthbertson and James Vitrano. And he's like, just do your thing. So here's why I'm telling you all this. I pulled the trigger, gave him three and a half months notice. I come every night from Southfield, come to Rochester, start learning it. Nobody knew who I was, didn't know I was there. And uh, I remember... So it was going to be my first day on a Monday. It was, so I did council meeting in Southfield, wouldn't let them have a party. And I threw all the retirement parties. I threw some nasty parties and got people trips around the world for all the money we gathered from these parties. And I'm like, nope, I'm embarrassed that I'm leaving you. No parties. And they were all mad at me. So Mayor Lawrence wouldn't talk to me anyway. So she, I came, council meeting at midnight. I got out at 1.30. I was at work in Rochester 8 in the morning. So I retired for, what, six and a half hours. So I remember walking to the front door in City Hall. And I had been there at night, but never with the staff there. And they're all kind of waiting for me. And I walked in, and I'm like, oh, my God, I think I made the biggest mistake of my life. I'm over my head. I know every single thing about Southfield. I know every crack in the cement. I know mm. every human. I know everybody's kid's name. Oh, my God, what did I do? I'm, I'm over my head. And I You're panicked. starting over from I'm zero. I'm starting over, and I'm like, oh, my God, what did I do? And I remember going and going, oh, and 
they're like, we don't know what the job is. Just make James like, you just figure this out. You're going to be the face of Rochester. I'm not. You just figure it out. I'm like, what does that mean? And he's like, I don't know. They want an economic development guy. And I said, I had 8,700 businesses in Southfield, and you have 370. He's like, so get to know all of them. James is a very wise man for all young guys. He got me. He got Chief Shetnam. He got Chief Seaslick. He got all these retired guys to take. We didn't do it for the money anymore, so we didn't need to work. Yeah. So we could pay us a third of what we were getting before or less. And then, but he he was just this, like, he was like the Pied Piper. You wanted to be around James because he just had this thing. I knew his family. I got to know the kids and Lynn really well. And I, somehow I just, I remember having to write reports like every month. I'd say I went and visited six businesses for retention, attraction, and, and um, expansion. And I remember the D, Christy Trevaro, this legendary DDA director, called me a used car salesman. And this is the story that keeps driving me. Just told this at the Rotary last week. First day, it's 8 o'clock, 8.05. I go back, and my, they show me where my office is. And Sarah Lowe's, very conservative girl, Billy Clerk, comes on. She goes, Mr. Banda. No, it's Nick. Mr. Banda, there's a guy at the counter wants to say hi to you. I don't know anybody here. I didn't know how to get to Rochester, barely. And so I walk out. This little guy, I said, I little Italian guy, I could tell. $5,000 suit, hair slicked back. And I'm going to have to swear one time. And he um, looks at me, he goes, six out of his hand, he goes, Vito Pampelona. And I said, okay. I, and he said, I know who you are. I said, I looked around, and everybody's standing there. And I'm like, um, okay, okay, what's what can I do for you? He's like, don't, I know who you are. Don't bring that Southfield shit here. And he walked out. And I stood there, I'm like, actually said effing shit. And I looked around, and they're like, oh. And every kind of scatters. And I go back to my office. I'm like, talk to Karen Parker, my secretary. I'm like, who is Vito Pampalone? And she goes, why? I said, he just said that to me. She's like, he doesn't speak for the community, Nick. That's the godfather out here. So I looked up where his address was. It was on Main Street. Went out at 11 o'clock. Stayed there till 11.45. Saw him come out of his office for lunch. Got in my car. Had a black Jeep. He had a black Mercedes. Walked up to him, I go, hey, Mr. Vito Pampolono. He goes, Pampolono. And I said, whatever. And I said, if you ever effing swear in front of the ladies in the front of City Hall, I'm going to kill you. Don't ever do that. You're a little pipsqueak Italian. I'm a gypsy. For 200 bucks, I can get you taken out. Don't ever do that again. He looks at me, he goes, son, you got a pair of pretty big cojones. And he goes, I like that. He hugs me. Best friends ever since. So wow. here I am. I'm thinking I'm coming to this great community, and they're annihilating me. And I thought I was scared. I'm like, this guy, I can't, I don't know these people. I played with the big boys, mm -hmm. Dan Gilberts, and all these guys in Southfield. And here's this little guy. And it turns out he, he just had, a, he loved Rochester, and he didn't want bad stuff happening. Yeah. So as I guess the, the, the point of my story is you never have it licked. You always have to look over your shoulder to go, I'm not. I might have thought I I earned the right for respect from everybody. They didn't know who I was, yeah. so I had to I had to start over, earn the respect again. I've been here 14, almost going on. This is my into my 14th year, and I now feel like I am as confident about Rochester as I was in Southfield because I never stopped learning from the people. Listen to them. Listen first. Talk that. Talk next, and then. So I was economic development guy. And they made me have the title of deputy city manager. Didn't want to be a city manager. That's a tough, weird job. You have to be bred to be a James Vitrano. Seven, the story could go on and on and on, but James left me after five years because he couldn't take it anymore. He's like, I don't know how you've done this your whole life. I'm done. And he walked outside. We, we cried together, and he left. So they made me interim city manager for six months So we found a guy that, we'll just leave it, he didn't work out for seven years. I covered that person's hiney to the point where my employees a year ago, we're like, we're all quitting because you're covering this guy. And he didn't do anything illegal, immoral, or anything. He just he, he wasn't ready to be a city manager. And, mm -hmm. and I wouldn't do it. So we went on a nationwide search, couldn't find anybody. We had an internal candidate. Just when you think you have it licked, that you've worked really hard to get that job, our internal candidate bombed his interview. And the council looked and said, we're not taking him. So now, 
that guy's top of his game, and he couldn't get the job that he wanted. So he could have quit, said, screw everybody, I'm out of here, you can get a job anywhere, or he could figure out the next step. So they 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 offered the job to this guy that we knew was going to be a train wreck, worse than the previous city manager. And I looked at the mayor, I go, I retire. My police chief, I retire. Fire chief, I'm going to retire. We're all quitting. You can't pick this other person. And the mayor looked at me and goes, okay, who's going to do it then? You're going to be city manager, Nick. And I'm like, nope. He said, we just went through a nationwide search, and the third best candidate was the IKEA manager in Canton, who said, I could be a city manager. That's how bad the talent pool is in government. That's a whole different story. Someday we a little podcast with you about yeah, how yeah. you get into government so we have people who care about your community. Yeah. And I said, fine, I'll stay for a little while. The mayor's like, no, I want one year. Went home, talked to my wife, and said, and she always was like, why aren't you the city manager? Everybody thinks you are anyway. It doesn't matter. I'm yeah. Like, because I don't want that title. I like working. I get to do all the best. I am the poop picker upper. When everything's wrong, I take care of every problem in Rochester. I did it in Southfield. I thrive on that. Just give me the challenges. What does the city manager do? Sit in a barca lounger all day? I don't know what they do. So the mayor's like, just keep doing what you're doing. All right. So then he called me on a Monday and said, you know what? That's How about you just take the date off that you're not going to retire and we'll just figure it out together. We're all going to run for a few more years. Can you give us two, three years? I said, man, I'm 69 years old. This only happened a few months ago. And I'm like, what are you going to do, Nick, when you retire? I don't know. And this is Mayor Stuart Pixon. He said, so here's what I'm going to do when I retire. I'm going to get up in the morning, eat breakfast, ride my bike to Lake Orion, come back, take a shower, eat lunch, take a nap, go see my dad for dinner. What are you going to do? You're going to go to your cottage? Kim going to go to your cottage? Your grandbaby's in Austin. She goes down 10 days a month. What are you going to do? Don't know. He said, so you don't think you have anything to give to the world because you're 69 years old? I, I don't know, sir. He said, just keep working. So I talked to Kim. She's like, this is what you do. This is what you love. And you're having fun again. Now the past is the past and the whole team. I had my old secretaries come out of retirement to come back to work with me. Wow. All the department had stayed. Not because it's Nick Banda. Because they know I'm them, and I'm honest, and I'm going to work as hard as they are. And we are. Ha- it's been a year now, and I'm having a blast. And I don't care what my title says, Ryan. I, it doesn't matter. You've done it all anyway. I don't so care. <laughs> it doesn't matter. I don't poo- I'm still the poop picker upper. And I didn't hire my old job back. I'm doing that job and this job because I. that's what I need. I need to have something to do every day and work hard. So I'm getting the right people in place. I'm bringing in a Jeremy Peckins, a young man, Who's going to be the planning and zoning administrator now? He's going to be me when I was young. And I'm going to watch him flourish, and I'm going to get the biggest grin on my face because I mentored that kid. I fished with his dad. He was in in high school, just doing filing for me. He's like, someday I'm going to work for you, Mister Banda. Jeremy starts next Monday. Oh my goodness! Full circle, boom. <laughs> you you sitting in that chair telling it's so fun that you that's unbelievable. It's so fun. I'm wow. so thankful, Brian, for everything I ever got. God's got some wild plan for me. Just don't take me out yet, and I'll be a happy camper. No, it's been, I can't even wrap my head around the, the whole story. It's unbelievable. So I, I would like to wrap it up with some type of, yep. um, some some learning lessons from a number of the things that, I mean, I've already picked up on a number of things, that, and that's part of this, where I sit down and I kind of talk about some of the things that I learned from sitting down and listening. Um, but I would like to hear from yourself um, two different p- parts here. So two different questions. One is is in regards to what you do specifically. So government, I, well, let's try to be more uh, widespread yep. versus just city. Um, if someone was looking to get into government, yep. what are three tips that you would give them? Good. Thank and, you for asking that. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. No, I just want you to be as specific as you can to that. Okay. Um, just some core lessons that maybe you learned or things like maybe doing it for the right reason. It sounds like one is <laughs> that stood out to me most. So I would tell you that, and thank you for asking that question, because whenever I go to the Rotary or wherever I got to talk, I st- we do this thing, Leadership Rochester, Leadership Oakland, and I can't wait to talk. And then we do we go to PAR and talk to their whole staff. And all these young leaders come in, and my first thing is, wh- why not government? Okay, it was, I want to be a fireman so I can be in a calendar, but you might die when you're a fireman if you're in Detroit. Yeah. I want to be a policeman. Well, now you might get shot when you're a policeman. It's no more glamour. I want to be in government because I get a pension. Nick, you're sitting there making more money laying in bed than you are working. Um, So is that the reason why I should get in government? Nope. It's called public servant. So first tip, 
understand yourself, realize that wherever you got, somebody was a servant to you. And I don't mean mm. that in a negative way. They no, they, that, they, had to do, they had to do something to subservient. I don't know what the right word is. Be a subservient to you yeah. to let you flourish. So now it's your time to give back. So I say to young people, government's not bad. You're not going to get a pension anymore. You're not going to make as much money. I can make millions of dollars in the private sector working for a developer that is against the government. I say, yeah. so you live in this. Everybody lives somewhere. Okay, go to wherever you live, township, city, rural, and Find something that interests you. You like the outdoors. Then you like their parks. What do you like that, that you get for your tax dollars? Figure that out and then see who's in charge of that division's dollars. You like parks. So the parks division spends those dollars. So there's a parks commission. So go to some of the meetings, watch what they do, and then be your own future. Caddyshack, see the ball, be the ball. That That is something. You want to be the ball, then you got to see it first. So go see what's going on in government. And then I tell them, Join a border commission. That's my second most important thing. First, discover what your tax dollars pay for. Then find out who's spending them. And then volunteer your time and listen and learn. Make a decision of your own, how you spend your own tax dollars. I love when someone comes in and says to me, I pay your salary. And I'm like, dude, I live in Rochester. I pay my own salary too. Yeah. And I earn it every single day because I am a public servant. Yeah. So, then you get a taste of government and you go, oh, that's cool. Then if you're young enough or you're retiree even, and you say, now I want to run for city council, baby. Maybe I want to run for mayor. You start with the boards and commissions. Then you get involved in your community at a higher level where you're making decisions, right? But when you're young enough, if you get in there young enough, it might be, boy, there. I really like Parks and Rec. There's the assistant director, Parks and Rec. I'm a smart business person. I could turn that into a career, so... I think you've got it. Government, you're right, it's broad. So you could you have to pick your battle. So I despise big government. Mm -hmm. I don't I completely different from what you've done. Brooks Patterson, one of my heroes, because Brooks was everybody thought he was, he was an egomaniac, but why? He loved he would die for Oakland County. He found the best of the best employees under him and then he supported them. And he took care of them so that he knew his county would be the top in the country, which it is. We're still top two or three in the whole country, economically, everything. But more importantly, it's the people that he recruited because they believed in his mission and his honesty, and he'd go to war for them. I will go to war for any of my employees. Never, you can screw me once, shame on you. Screw me twice, shame on me. I won't let that happen. I'm never going to set you up for that. So I think you find somebody in government that you respect and then get involved, support them, be on a border commission. And then maybe yeah. it might not be you, but your kids might want to be in government. And that's, my kids did. My kid wanted to be a doctor and stuff. He wanted to be a social influencer. And my daughter, Jamie, is colors hair and makes more money than everybody probably. <laughs> um, they all took different ways. But yeah. they all respected, and they were there. Every time I had a public event, my kids were with me. And well, I was and they, I, I would think, and I'm getting this from you from, chatting with you for an hour and a half, but I'm sure that they learn the value in people and respecting people, learning from people, relationships that you can create with people over time and, and caring about others. So regardless of what they took that into, I can tell you that that's probably something that they picked up on if I'm picking up on it in an hour and a half. No, I appreciate it. And I, I, don't, I never lectured them and I didn't want them to be in government because they all wanted to make a lot of money. They're, that generation, your generation is more a little bit driven. I get it. I got it. So Devin wanted to be a doctor. Well, you ask him now. He's a hand surgeon. His he just got married last Tuesday to a hand to a shoulder surgeon. Him and Lisa, it's they're now looking at thirty one and thirty. Their Devin's thirty six. Believe it or not, he's nineteen eighty eight. So I remember from hockey. So he um, money's driving him now. He's like, it's not all about that. Once you get enough money, then you got to have some fulfillment. I'm like, I did it the opposite. Didn't care about the money. Cared about the fulfillment. And he said, if I had to do it over again, I might not be a doctor because I don't know that I'm mentally fulfilled by this job. He's really good at being a hand surgeon. Yeah. So, and I'm like, no, no, we need that. The world needs you to save them physically. Yeah. The world needs government people to make sure that they're not all corrupt and they're not doing bad things. And yeah. there is so faith and there's really hard working people in local government and the county. And then when you get up into politics, that's not necessarily government. I don't call the legislature 
that's politics. That's not yeah. government. They don't, they, they dole out the money, but we do the work. So they got to count on us to be the consistent people. So it's a, you guys are the ones profession. that are actually making, putting things into action, <laughs> not just and there's bad ones, right? There's yeah. bad ones, but I'm telling I you, I never, there's nobody corrupt in Southfield, nobody corrupt in Dearborn. Things have changed all over the world, but I am proud to say the people I work with, we are public servants and you just get there by keeping your nose clean and working hard. Well, we're grateful to have you. So I appreciate that. Um, second piece to this. So outside of government, if you were to give some advice to someone who is just starting off, who's at, let's go back to when we talked about ground zero, no clue what they're going to do, no clue why, what's the starting point? What would be, and I know I, I, I'm already picking up on a couple of things that I think you're going to say, but what would be three things that you would give as advice to those people? So I'm going to surprise you. So okay. again, I told you I'm not a religious man, but I always went to church. My wife's very Catholic. I agreed to raise, raise the kids Catholic. I'm Romanian Orthodox. They didn't speak Romanian English at my church, and my mom and dad didn't want us to learn Romanian. They wanted us to acclimate to the United States, even though I was born here. What I learned was from things like the boys' club, church, church. You go to church, and then you say, I'm going to be in the government of the church, and you sit on a board. And guess what you're going to do? You're going to learn very successful people. You're going to network without them knowing it, and they're going to open a door for you through mm -hmm. that i think if you are lucky enough to have kids or not you get into coaching be around young people so you get their energy and then hopefully you share something about what you stand for and then being part of a team i think because i started at such a young age playing sports but then i coached Devin for mini mites all the way to junior a and and to, to play in college division two and all stuff but i think if you take that route it's it you're going to meet somebody on your team. If you're the coach, all the parents are going to suck up to you. That's just the way it goes. And you're going to find somebody in a profession that will help you decide how to make yourself better. More importantly, it's, it might open the door for your sibling or your, I'm sorry, your child to actually look at some different things. So I only know government, but I know all these people that I've coached in the years. I've had some incredible parents. And then I learned what they're doing for a living and they think it's really cool. I, I sat with... Dan Gilbert, of all people, he's Danny to me because he grew up in Southfield and I could tell you stories about him and how hard he worked and what he believed in. And he was a, what are all the stuff he did in his private life? He's a wild man, but look at what he did. I got the opportunity to watch that guy and and he would come to me and go, let's just talk about Southfield. And I'm like, you're Dan Gilbert. I'm talking to a billionaire. Yeah. And he'd go, let's get on my jet and go watch LeBron James play when he owned the Cavaliers. I'm like, oh, okay, we can do that, but he wanted to show me a development that they were doing on there these weird doors that open and never never in my opinion be in awe of anybody respect them for what they've done if they got it clean respect them more know they they took that journey and busted their butt and they might make a billion dollars a year and i don't but when i sit in a room with the ceo of magnum my wife we go to christmas parties and the guy named Ed Gould, like powerful, powerful band. He'd sit down, he'd make me sit next to him. I'm like, I hope I don't embarrass myself. And he's like, I want to hear about government. How do you make decisions every day? I'm like, you're running a $50 billion company. How do you do that and sleep at night? He's like, yeah. who cares? The guy next door is dog pooped on my lawn. How would you handle that, Nick? And I'm like, and they genuinely care. Don't overestimate people's depth. Yeah. So, so relate if you come in my office Ryan, it's a museum there's a million things from hockey lacrosse fishing i'm a fishing maniac in my office why my dad did this too when somebody comes in my office they're usually pissed off about something whether it's development or i'm mad at you or a resident and they sit down and i don't say a word for the first 10 seconds and they start looking around the walls and like what's that beaver meat thing there or what's that lacrosse ball there and and I, their, their minds get off of it. They find something in common. What's that shoe shining thing that, well, that was my grandpa's. He used to shine shoes. And then you break that ice. So third thing. So I think I gave you two. The third one would be find something outside of work that you believe in. For me, it's Trout Unlimited. I happen to be a trout fisherman, but not an elitist. So I joined the Paul Young chapter Trout Unlimited because two guys, Bill Walker and Ray Gitka, were lunatic fishermen but they didn't know how to raise money. And I support all my hockey teams by raising money with sponsors. So you're allowed mm -hmm. to get a sponsor, right? So the gift of gab can get you in that. We delivered, and they got their money's worth of sponsors. So I found a passion outside of what I did at work, which was Trout Unlimited. 
to raise hundreds of thousands of dollars for. And in that journey of raising all that money, where I was able to fund things in Montana, I got to fish with Ted Turner and Jane Fonda on their ranch because they appreciated that we gave them $40,000. Ted Turner to fix a beaver kill river. It was insane. So again, I looked and I thought that I didn't do it to, to get to that, but I found something outside of work. So I didn't become a workaholic hundred percent, find some other passion that you have, and then make sure it's something that's good for the world that will help. For me, it was cold water, respecting the cold water fishery, raise the money or put your effort in, go to the work weekends, put your butt in the river and plant alders and you're going to meet somebody someday that's going to change your life. And it might not be for a job or for it will be my life's more valuable and more. I have more experience listening to a Wally Dabrowski or a Ray Gick or a Bill Walker. And they're like, Where, how do you raise 100000 in a weekend? I'm like, no, how did you know to plant these alders in the river? doesn't matter what lever you're at. It's not all about money. It's about effort. It's about believe in the mission and then do whatever it takes to get the mission accomplished. Yeah. And then you're there. I, and I think you got to find things from work, out work, and then give back coaching, be on your church board, be in a board of commission, give back. Yeah. If you don't, you're a loser. Yeah, Then you're I, a taker, and I hate that. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I have so many things that I want to say, but I, I really do want to wrap this up with, with thanking you for the, how much, well, outside of just being here, so much of your life, it seems like, has been about contributing and helping and supporting and providing for others, your family, the community, everybody that you work with is all about trying to help contribute to a team or whatever it is that you are a part of. And so I want to thank you for being someone that, that thinks of others first and it's something that we need a lot more of in this world. So I want to thank you for I that first that. off. It's very fun. Good but job. today, I also want to thank you for being here today with you. Again, oh, it's, it's you're awesome. here to help me and I appreciate you giving me all the insights that you did. I There's so many things that I benefited from this and I appreciate you sharing all these crazy stories because it's perspectives that, that I didn't have and things that I didn't go through in my life. So I learned lots and I appreciate it. And, I, and I, I'm a babbler and I appreciate the opportunity and someday... I'd like to see at the very end of my last moments on there, God go, this is why I put you down here because I still don't know. <laughs> but it's all good. We're still figuring, everybody's figuring it out. Yeah, so. they, and you better. All right, thank you. All right, friend. well, I want to thank everybody for tuning in, making the time to learn today, understanding the and believing in the ability to get better. Um, we will see you next time and never stop pursuing precision. Thank you. All right, everybody. So that is going to conclude episode eight with Nick Banda. I hope you guys enjoyed this one and learned lots from all the awesome stories that he was able to share throughout this entire podcast. I'm now going to wrap it up with the top three things that I learned. One, the only way that you will ever actually fail is if you quit. Nick showed over and over and again in his career how many different jobs he took, how many different challenges he took on when he had no clue what he was doing as he was leaping and taking a, a leap of faith into something new. And the only one consistency is the fact that he never gave up. He never had any confidence. He never knew that this was going to be the exact direction that he was going to go. And yet he continued to push forward and never quit. And he was able to finally find his path in local government Two. You don't need the perfect plan in order to find your way. Now, in this interview, when we talk with Nick about how he was able to get into the position that he's in now in local government, he explained all kinds of different jobs that he took and all these different experiences that he had that had no association realistically with local government. But the moral of the story is he continued to do and act and move forward and learn and take on new experiences which led him to where he was in finding what he was truly passionate about. So a lot of times I think people look at their career as something that needs to be decided way in advance. And what I think we learn from Nick is the fact that if you continue to work hard, do the right things, put yourself around the right people, you're going to find your way naturally through it happening in your life. Three, and this is going to be by far the most important one that I took from Nick, is to value everyone. So one consistency that I can tell you through all the things that I learned in his stories and experiences that he had throughout his career is that he always valued people. 
which is shocking that he, of course, ends up in local government where he's serving and helping others. He always was thinking about his team. He was always thinking about others. He was always thinking about how he can serve, how he can help other people. And he always looked as someone looked at people around him as someone to learn from and to uh, gain experience from. So really, really important, whether this was something that was way, someone that was way ahead of him in his career or someone that was below him or someone that worked for him. He always treated everybody with the same respect and, and continued to learn from everybody that he was surrounded by. So huge lesson learned there and something that you guys can apply to your lives. So that is going to conclude the three things that I learned from Nick Banda. Thank you guys all so much for tuning in and making the time to learn today. We'll see you in the next episode and never stop pursuing precision.